you say it again, Merry Christmas. It's great to have you worship with us tonight on this uh, Christmas Eve. It is a white Christmas in a different kind of way today, but maybe one that's going to be easier to drive in. A weary traveler on Christmas Day Eve, trying to make it home for the holidays, noticed in the airport there a cheap-looking plastic mistletoe hanging over the ticket counter at the airport. Looking at the attendant, he noticed that she didn't look like she was in any mood to be kissed by a stranger. And so we asked of her, of all places, why is this mistletoe hanging here? She looked at him smugly and said, oh, that, it's there so you can kiss your luggage goodbye. (laughs) Well, you've done well. You've made it this far. It's Christmas Eve, and you've taken the time to focus in on the true meaning of the celebration. So I congratulate you for being here tonight. I understand how easy it is to miss the point. I understand how easy it is to get so busy in the hustle and bustle of the season. And so tonight I want to talk about something that song kind of brings to our attention, I want to talk about those wise men, those magi we often read about in Scripture. Tonight I want to talk about whatever they were. We sing a song, We Three Kings. They certainly were not kings. Magi, astronomers, wise men, whatever they were, whether they were two or three or 20, we do not know. But as we talk about these magi tonight, I want us to think about why. You ever thought about why? Why would they even want to seek out this Jewish king? Why would they even care? Why would magi from an area that we know as Babylon have any interest in making this incredible 1,000-mile journey, maybe taking three, maybe 12 months, what possible interest would those magi have had coming from Babylon to Israel to seek out this newborn king? More often than not, the Babylonians were enemies to the Israelites. Well, the answer is we don't know for sure, but let me pull a thread on what many scholars believe. And follow me if you can. This thread takes us back to the time of Daniel. Many of us know Daniel in the Old Testament. Daniel and the lion's den, right? Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, his friends. That Daniel, that very Daniel, well, Daniel was an Israelite who was taken to Babylon during the exile and held there in captivity along with thousands of others. Though they faced incredible pressure to conform to the pagan culture and the religion of the Babylonians, they stood strong against it. And eventually, Daniel was called on by King Nebuchadnezzar, if you remember his story at all, to interpret dreams. Remember that story? And Daniel was so successful in interpreting these dreams and advising the king that he was ultimately promoted to a very high place of authority and and power in Babylon, which is very strange, but he was. But this is where it gets really interesting. While most of us know the story of Daniel, one of his jobs is often overlooked. According to Daniel 5.11, I think it's going to come up on the screen. Listen to what this says. There is a man talking about Daniel in your kingdom who has the spirit of the holy gods in him. In the time of your father, he was found to have insight and intelligence and wisdom like that of the gods. Your father, King Nebuchadnezzar, appointed him, listen carefully, appointed him chief of the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and diviners. So King Nebuchadnezzar assigned the prophet Daniel to the high office of chief of these different areas. In other words, Daniel was appointed the chief of the Magi. 
and now you see the connection. In an incredible display of his sovereignty, God placed his servant Daniel in a foreign land in captivity, but then elevated him to a place of authority among those people. Why? To begin making preparations for Jesus' birth that wouldn't happen for another 600 years. And here's what you need to know. Not only was Daniel chief of the Magi, but his prophecies, his writings, his works became known throughout the ancient Near East. Even the Romans were aware of his prophecies of this coming king in Israel. And many scholars believe those Babylonian Magi, the wise men, of the first century, at the time of Jesus' birth and the appearance of the star, would have most certainly studied the writings of Daniel and possibly other Jewish writings that Daniel referenced, for example, the book of Isaiah. And this connection between Daniel and the Magi may help explain why almost 600 years later, the Magi in question expected a Jewish king to arrive in Judea near the end of the first century B.C., And it is likely that the Magi that followed that star based their study on the writings of the prophet Daniel. I would further submit that it was ultimately Daniel's influence on those Magi that compelled them to bring gifts. The gifts we'll talk about tonight, the perfect gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And many scholars go on to believe that these gifts were then used by Mary and Joseph to finance their flight to Egypt when it was learned that Herod was determined to kill the baby Jesus. Just in time, just what they needed. It's incredible to me to see the hands of God working out the incarnation story. Emmanuel, God with us, through these vast and varied pages of Scripture in such detail that over half a millennia before Joseph and Mary even began their Bethlehem journey. But he did. But I suppose with a God as incredible as ours, unlimited in power and unhindered by time or space, why should we be surprised? The point in all this is there is nothing random in God's story. Daniel in Babylon lays a groundwork for the journey of the Magi 600 years later, bringing gifts that would provide for another journey as that family fled to Egypt. And I would submit to you the gifts they brought were not random either. There is a message in those gifts, those perfect gifts as well. Have you ever stopped to think about those gifts? I mean, they do seem some, somewhat odd. I want, I want to read the scriptural record of those gifts. If you've got your Bibles, you can turn to Matthew chapter 2. And let's read this story of the Magi. It says in Matthew chapter 2, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and ask, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. And when he called together all the people, people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and Worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. 
Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. These three gifts brought by these magi, why gold, frankincense, myrrh? Some might ask, why were they perfect? I don't know about you, but at first glance, they seem a bit odd to me. I'm thinking about the first family. They've just had this long journey. They're, they're, They're in a stable of some kind, not in the best situation. I would think a more practical gift might be a, maybe a mega pack of diapers. What about you? I don't know, maybe a cute little onesie that says mommy's little angel on it. Maybe that would have been a more appropriate gift. Maybe a binky or, or, or some baby powder. Maybe a, a free babysitting coupon would have been a, a, a welcome sight. Maybe a, a burger and fries and a cup of coffee would have been a good gift. But gold and frankincense and myrrh, what's so perfect about that? What's a baby going to do with gold and tree sap? Well, let's talk about it. The first perfect gift was gold. And well, this one I suppose we can understand. Gold would always be a good gift, right? Right? Not a woman's best friend, but definitely a strong acquaintance, right? I don't know about you. Have you ever wondered why it is that a a woman's best friend, you know, is a diamond, right? Diamonds are a girl's best friend. Isn't Isn't that what the saying goes? Yet a man's best friend is a dog. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. Why is it that women get diamonds and men get the flea-bitten, mangy dog the neighbor didn't want anymore? <laughs> you see the inequity in that? I digress. The first wise man, as we traditionally understand, brought a gift of gold. Gold, if you're taking notes, gold was a gift fit for a king. It's a gift of royalty. And it was indeed a custom in that day that in order to approach the king, one must bear a gift. You would not come before a king without offering a gift. And the most fitting gift for royalty was gold. Some things haven't changed, right? It it was customary in that day. And sometimes we forget that baby, helpless, harmless little baby, was a king. We talked about it in our story with the children In fact, he wasn't just a king, he was the king of kings, amen? We would do well to remember that Jesus indeed was and is a king. And and we can never, because of that, we can never meet Jesus as an equal. We must always meet him on terms of complete submission and complete surrender to him. It, It is said that even Napoleon understood the kingship of Jesus. It was said of Napoleon that his presence on the battlefield, Napoleon's presence on the battlefield was equivalent to 10,000 men. He was so powerful. He was such a forceful uh, personality. But of Jesus, many, many scholars believe that Napoleon said the following. He said, I know men, and I tell you that Jesus Christ is not a mere man. Superficial minds see a resemblance between Christ and the founders of empires and the gods of other religions. He says that resemblance does not exist. Everything in Christ, Napoleon says, astonishes me. Between him and whoever else in the world, there is no possible term of comparison. Yes, King Jesus treats us with love and compassion, but he must be approached as one who is superior. He is the king. Lord Admiral Nelson, the great British naval commander in the 1800s, had a reputation for always treating those that he defeated with great kindness and great courtesy. After one of his naval victories, the defeated admiral was brought aboard Nelson's flagship to surrender. 
Knowing Nelson's reputation for courtesy, he advanced across the quarterdeck quickly with hand outstretched, and he, he was reaching out to shake uh, Nelson's hand as an equal. But Nelson's hand remained at his side. He said, your sword first, and then your hand. The truth in that is powerful. There is humility required as we approach the king. Before we can be friends, William Barclay said, before we can be friends with Christ, we must submit to Christ. He is a king. The first perfect gift of gold was fit for a king. Let's talk about the second perfect gift, frankincense. Other than this list of gifts, we would have no idea what frankincense was. But it is still a gift that can be purchased today. In fact, you can still get frankincense in the country of Oman. Frankincense is an aromatic gum resin that seeps from cuts in the Boswellia sacra tree. And even though a pound of frankincense can be purchased today for about 10 bucks, in ancient times, it was worth its weight in gold. It is still burned as fragrant incense and is also used in an Omani perfume, one of the most expensive perfumes at over $200 an ounce. The truth is what we need to know about frankincense was that in ancient times, frankincense was a gift fit for a priest. A gift fit for a priest. In fact, frankincense was only used in temple worship. It was handled only by the priest. No one else could touch it. The function of the priest is to do what? To, to open the way for, God's, for, for people to come to God. And isn't that interesting? When you think about that gift of frankincense, representing what the priest did, representing who Jesus was and what Jesus did. The Latin word for priest is pontifex, which literally means bridge builder. The wise men somehow knew that Jesus is the one who would build a bridge for us to come into the very presence of God. He bridges the gap and gives us a path to have a relationship with the Father. He came as a king. He came as a priest in fact, the Bible says that he is our great high priest. That's why frankincense is a perfect gift for Jesus. The third perfect gift was that of myrrh. Myrrh, like frankincense in the Old Testament, was worth its weight in gold. It is harvested from the dindin tree, they say. Writings from almost 3,000 years ago note that it was used in embalming, embalming. Myrrh was a gift fit for one who would die. The wise men somehow knew that not only was Jesus king worthy of our submission, not only was he priest, the one who would bring us into a personal relationship with the Father, they knew that Jesus would accomplish all this by dying. And so they brought myrrh. In 1870, William Holman Hunt painted a picture of Jesus in a carpenter shop. There it is. He called it the shadow of death. Jesus had evidently been working hard in the shop. And he takes a few moments to step away from the bench and he extends his arms to stretch. I want you to notice the shadow. The sunlight shining through that arched door of the shop cast a shadow on the wall of the shop. It is the shadow of the cross. In that picture, Mary looks at the shadow in distress, knowing the price that her son will pay as king and priest and the one who will die. Jesus was born that first Christmas not just to lead the way to God as a king might lead, not just to bridge the way to God as a priest might bridge, but in the end to die for the penalty 
of our sins. And because of that reality, myrrh was a perfect gift for Jesus. Gold shows his kingship, frankincense his priesthood, myrrh his sacrificial death on the cross. They were perfect gifts. Even at the very beginning, we are painted with a picture about the end of why this baby came. The most famous of William Holman Hunt's paintings is the depiction of Jesus. It's kind of dark, it's an old painting. Jesus standing knocking at the door of our lives. You've probably all seen a picture similar to that one. Hunt's depiction is based on the invitation of Jesus. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him, Revelation 320. And this really brings us to the good news of Christmas. Number one, you can open the door of your life and ask Jesus to be your king. Number two, you can open the door of your life and through Jesus the priest, enter into a personal relationship with the heavenly father. And number three, you can open the door of your life to the forgiveness that Jesus brings to our lives through his death for us. And when we allow Jesus to come in, we'll never be the same again. And I just wonder tonight, as we think about gifts, the perfect gift that we can give to Jesus is simply the gift of ourselves. Would you pray with me? Our Father, tonight I thank you for the perfect gifts that were brought to Jesus on that holy night. On a surface level, they don't make a lot of sense to us, but when we come to understand what they represent, they truly paint a picture of who this child was to be, a king, a priest, and a sacrifice. And oh, what a difference that has made. Down through the years, we just read the story and sometimes we miss the important application. But on this Christmas, again, we are reminded why Jesus came came to save the souls of men and women, teenagers and boys and girls, those that would put their trust, that would submit to him, allow him to be to us what we so desperately need. And I just wonder tonight in the quietness of this moment as we reflect on these things, if there might be some in this room who want to make that decision to put their faith, to give their life to this king, to bow the knee, to submit to his care, his, his control. Father, thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you that through the repentance of our sins, we can be saved, we can be forgiven, we can be made brand new. And there is no better message in the world at Christmas time or any other time that Jesus saves. Thank you, Lord for your grace and for your goodness. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're gonna have a chance now to symbolize our faith, what Christ has given to us in, in my favorite part of our Christmas Eve service. If you take your candles out, It's symbolic, but the message is powerful. As the flame is passed from one to the next, the light is going to signify Jesus Christ. Your acceptance of the light as it is passed to you will represent your acceptance of the Christ child that you have welcomed into your life. And if you've never made that commitment, you can right now in these moments. And in doing so, join the celebration of, of coming, the coming of Jesus as the light of the world. Let's invite his presence into our lives this Christmas Eve. Let's receive his light. 
I'm going to ask you to stand with us during this portion of the service. Those who are going to help us with our candles this morning, if you would make your way down. candles going down each aisle Isaiah chapter 9, it says, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. In John chapter 1, It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Can we sing together, Silent Night? Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright. I am a virgin.
God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. We hold in our hands a candle, a flame, a light that represents what we have been given on this sacred night. The Son of God, born into this world. that in an amazing way shone light into our life made an incredible difference in us. I pray that as we leave from this place tonight, we take this light, we let it shine brightly, and we shine his light into a dark world that needs him. Our Father, thank you for these sacred moments tonight. Thank you for the great gift of Jesus. Thank you for what he did for what he's doing and Lord what he will continue to do we put our full trust in him for he is enough and so God as we're dismissed from this place tonight would your presence go with us would we honor you in these hours celebrating the gift of your son in Jesus name we pray and all God's people said Amen. Amen. I would ask as you're dismissed tonight that you extinguish those candles carefully and then they'll be picked up as you exit the doors tonight. God bless you. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas.